right, thank you very much. Hi everyone. And I won't say good morning because I know people are all over. And so just um, happy to be here and have a chance to talk with you. I realized that I've got eight minutes, so I just started my clock. Um, here to talk to you today about understanding diversity and the small end problem. And why do I want to talk about this? Because it's so important with everything we've just heard about very large data sets and the computational methods that can be used, especially when data are large, we get good answers to, to the questions that we have. But next slide, please. When you know that the population that you're looking at um, is actually very, very small, um, we know that there's an invisibility that exists. Now that may sound like an odd thing to say, but let's think about it. Um, there are some groups that we're unaware about. There are some other groups that are undercounted. Oftentimes, persons with disabilities, if it's not disclosed or not revealed, then oftentimes those groups are undercounted in, in a population or in a sample. And then sometimes we have uh, an issue with accuracy of accounting. Um, and maybe you know, we work on that, we fine tune that, but those data are not disclosed because the sample size is so small. So the small end problem um, or the invisibility is something that is really surfacing, um, especially when we want to understand how to do the following. How do we um, pro provide uh, um, you know, uh, resources for individuals that are in those small groups? So I'll talk about that a little bit later. The small end problem is something that's also uh, was picked up recently in an article by, in Harvard Business Review. It says, small numbers cannot be a, rational, a rationale to stall progress. Continuing uh, concluding that little can be said with limited data renders underrepresented groups more invisible and creates a roadblock to meaningful change. That I wanted to quote just because it is precisely what we're talking about. NCSES in their data set on women, minorities, and persons with disabilities and their recent report they call that out too. And it says that because of this, meaning um, the small m, it is important to analyze differences in science and engineering degrees awarded to um, people that are minorities, people of varying ethnicities, and also differentiating based on gender. And they, they say that that's incredibly important. But yet, next slide, you'll see that Oftentimes, though we know that intersectionality is important and looking at those cells, really important, um, sometimes those data are just not disclosed. They, they exist, they're counted, but not disclosed. Let me give you an example. I'm an economist, and so I looked up the data on this in NCSES's records, and in terms of PhDs, in economics in 2018, there were about 1,326 female within that count, 427, African-Americans within that count, 21. And if you go back even 20 years, it hovers between 15 and 21 African-Americans. But how many were African-American women? We don't know. It's not, we don't know the answer to that. Are the interventions for broadening participation in STEM the same for all of those categories? No. So we need better data, more granular data, and we need the disclosure of the data or some way of figuring this out and doing the quantitative analysis. That's one of the main points here. Next slide, please. And again, that's persistence. Look at that lower, the, the lowest line here, that's doctorates. Um, and the title here, is, if you can't see it, is science and engineering degrees earned by underrepresented minorities as a percentage of degree type. And this is from 2008 to 2018. And for the doctorates, you see, it's really just hovering right above that 10% level. Um, we want to see that increase. We want to see broadening participation in STEM um, for minorities in these particular areas. Next slide. Now, we know that Dr. Punch, the director of NSF, has also been calling this out um, quite effectively. And in a recent article um, in AAAS, news um, item, we see that he's addressing the, he calls it the missing millions. I'm saying invisible and, and the missing millions. People who are capable of succeeding as scientists and engineers 
but do not have access to pathways that lead into those careers. And you can see that for yourself. But I also wanted to bring out this other point, recent article again in the Chronicle of Higher Education, at public and private nonprofit four-year colleges in the fall of 2019, the most recent year for which the data existed, there were over 250,000 tenured associate full and full professors. Of those, 2.1% were Black women. Again, not just underrepresented, but woefully underrepresented. Let's look at another way of thinking about this. Next slide. What we oftentimes do when we see those numbers is think about, well, let's just fill up the pipeline. Let's get more people into the pipeline on the front end, and certainly they will end up coming out the other end, and some will end up in the professorate as well. That is something that we hear all the time. Kenny Gibbs and his colleagues wrote a recent paper um, that I'm referring to here showing that, and it's an interesting result, the model that they had predicts that in 2000, 2080, fewer than 10% of the system professors would be URMs if you just work with that pipeline model. So they recommend, next slide, that we really get away from that pipeline characterization and think more about pathways toward STEM degrees and pathways to the professorate, et cetera. That is really important, but it's not unique with them. Next slide, you'll see that there's a paper, a couple of papers that I worked on with Sam Myers, where we were talking about this pathways um, and the pathways to STEM. Um, one of the papers is seen here. We calculated representation ratios, not just shares, looking at, you know, relative to the likelihood of being a chemist um, and divide that into what's the likelihood of being, say, a black chemist. That's what these show. You can see these are all below one for white females, for African Americans, um, and for, for the most part, um, for Hispanics, et cetera. Those are under representation, those are representation ratios that are really showing what that deficit is in terms of um, trying to, and, and why we're trying to get to at least parity in terms of um, participation in STEM fields here, are biologists, chemists, and medical doctors. But we found that all groups do not benefit the same from the same in, in, in interventions. Next slide. That's what the second paper really shows pretty clearly here, that if you're looking at representation, uh, uh, if you're looking at white and Asian um, males, you see that more likely that, you know, having that post baccalaureate education is going to increase participation in STEM fields. But if you're looking at Hispanics and Blacks, uh, more likely that the wage pool is, is going to be the bidding into that. And if you look at the paper, you'll see that it's also true that the post-baccalaureate education was just not a one-size-fits-all variable for us. There were many other characteristics that could really change whether or not someone, um, we picked them up in the data as participating in STEM. So I know that I'm supposed to stop. So let me say, go to the two slides down. Um, the conclusion is that, you know, we know what we problem we want to solve. We want to increase participation in STEM. We want to see, um, you know, which intervention works for which population. We also want to make sure that this is not just about underrepresentation in STEM. This is about areas that are really important in terms of clean energy and water and sanitation solutions, about reducing health disparities, about improving urban and rural infrastructure. It's about all of those things. And so to do that, we need to communicate standards much more robustly about how to collect these data. We need to incentivize incentivize the development of these methodologies. And we need a clearinghouse where these data reside with the privacy all in place so that our so that our researchers can use the data and really devise this evidence-based policy. Last slide, please. Um, what you will see in this slide is my thank you for listening. And also I decided to make the invisible visible. I went to the citations that I used for this paper and I pulled out some of the faces so that you could see who is writing this work. And um, something that you probably should do in your own work too is look at what that representation in the canon is to see if it is diverse. Thank you very much.